Hello and welcome to Farmland. Later on this episode, I'll be speaking to independent TD for Roscommon Galway, Michael Fitzmaurice, about the current economic squeeze faced by rural communities. But first, I'm joined by Edgar Garcia Manzanilla, Head of Pig Development with Chagas, to discuss an interesting research project he and his colleagues are undertaking into pig development. By studying milk, faeces and saliva, Chagas researchers, along with researchers at the University of Lyon and the University of Mercia, are gaining a better understanding of piglets without even touching them. Edgar Garcia Manzanilla, thank you very much for joining us today. You're the head of pig development with Chagas and you're involved in a research project really looking at piglets and piglet development. Now, I suppose when pigs are born, they're very, like many other animals, dependent on the sow, on the mother. But on commercial farms, their development has to be somewhat expedited that little bit quicker. Tell me how fast that process is on a commercial pig farm. The first thing probably that we want to know is that a, a piglet like when it's born is like around 1 kilo, 1.2 kilos and, and the mother is close to 300 kilos and there is around 20 of them born in, in average so it's, it's a lot of, of uh, difference with the mother and they have to catch up with that big animal so the growth is, is very fast. So normally the piglets will be with the mother around 10, 12 weeks and in the commercial situation they are around at the moment 4 weeks. So that, that creates a, a difference with the natural period and, and the commercial period. They, they do quite well to the point that now, if, if you allow them to be for more than four weeks with the sow, they will take so much milk that maybe the sow cannot take it. So it's, it's kind of a, uh, an ideal situation there. So what, what we work with in, in that sense is to try to, to bring the animal to the best they can at that stage. And then from there, they go by themselves quite well. One of the things that you and your, your fellow researchers are looking at are, I suppose, the stress levels in piglets. What yes. impact does stress have on a piglet? Yes, uh, piglets are actually animals that uh, if, you, if you have been ever around a pig, the first thing that they do when you touch them is a scream. They, they are very curious and in one minute they will approach you to see what you are doing there and everything, but they don't like to be, let's say, approaching the wrong way. So these animals, because they scream and they get super excited when you try to do something to them, they go into an, an state of a physiological state that is beyond something that will be normal in other, in other animals. So it is, it is much more affecting them much more than, than other animals. For example, uh, one of the things that I put in the article, which, which started me this kind of thinking, is that I once I, I brought a sample of blood to one of the guys in the, in the hospital in, in, when I was in Spain. They told me, this is from a dead animal, isn't it? I said, no, this animal is still alive on the farm. And he said, well, this sample of blood will be from a dead animal in any other case because it seems like they don't have oxygen in the blood, so it's, they, they should be dead. So that, that kind of levels of stress is where they, where they get. That's why we, we try to work with non-stressing methods. With regard to milk and colostrum, that's something that you're looking at as part of the research. What sort of information do you know about that? Uh, well, we, we thought that the, the calostrum and the milk was something that was somehow, let's say, programmed to be in a, in a particular way, but not to the extent to what it actually happens. Because, for example, uh, uh, with the research that, that APEO made, the research that the Science and Paper is doing, we have seen that the, the change from calostrum to milk, calostrum is the, the milk that they will be drinking the first 48, 24 hours. But then it changes the, the profile of, of or the composition of the colostrum to the milk changes in a, in a very well defined way to the point that it, it looks like if you were doing it in a lab. So the, the sow is doing something there to manage the piglets in a very particular way and bring them to where, where they have to go. So if we went to do or simulate the same process, we actually have to, to do it in a very particular way. For example, using milk from a cow. That's not a completely different milk. Even when they are milk, they are completely different. So you have to bring the animal in a different way than, than they are programmed to do. So. And are you doing this within your research then, to, as you said, simulate this, what, that what they would get from the sow in a shorter period of time? Yes, uh, we actually have, not, not from a research, but we have a, a system from another researcher that is for supplementary milk and we can change the milk that they receive and all that. 
the research that we are doing in this project at the moment is more, let's say, experimental. So we, we are changing the the milk to a level that is is uh, very lab based. Let's say it's not really what will happen in commercial units. But but the small changes that you can do, for example, the milk in pigs is super high in fat if you compare it to uh, uh, milk from or milk from a cow. So those those big changes that are there, like the difference in fat and all that, are already up. Uh, changes that benefit the piglet. So in the future, I think we will go to very defined changes, but at the moment there are big changes that you can do and the piglet uh, becomes much better of, a, of an animal in the development. So. Mm, that's very interesting. I know that one element of your research as well also looks at the gut health mm. of pigs. Now there's a lot of research at the moment, certainly into the gut health of humans. Mm. Um, it's, it's very topical at the moment. How important is the gut health of pigs and what have you learned? Yes. Well, we, in that process, we are putting the piglet uh, to a, to a chal up to a challenge. It will be, actually, in, in Ireland, Ireland is a big producer of baby formulas, and piglets are actually the best mother for humans. So you put piglets in a situation that is very challenging, and whatever the piglet goes through, it's a very good model for humans. To the point that in Chagas, we just opened a biotest facility to test that, to use the pig, the pigs that we have in our farm. Some of them go into testing food for humans. So that, that challenge that we are doing with the gut health is very similar, as you say, all this research that is going for humans, it's happening also in piglets. And the, ol the only thing that you have to bear in mind is that sometimes some of the economic efforts that we do to improve the feed of the piglet, it's, it's, it's some of a moral, let's say, question because that 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 milk, if it is a very good quality milk, it could go to humans, so it wouldn't be right to 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 keep piglets. But the level of of uh, research and the level of challenge for the gut health of the animal is very similar to the to the human, especially babies. So it's it's kind of very similar. All this probiotic research, the in in a piglet, for example, the fact that we separate the piglet from the sow and then they don't get milk, it kind of let's say destroys the the gut for a while. So you have to rebuild the, the gut and restructure the microbial populations in a certain way. So that's what happens in many diseases in humans, that they lose the epithelium of the, of the intestine and they have to rebuild all these bacterial populations, which is very, also very well programmed. Like we, what we are learning now with the new methods that we have is that those populations are very well regulated and the animal knows what, what should be there and what they shouldn't. So it's, it's, it's something learning about the animal and helping the animal to develop what they need. I suppose that is the point of it, really, to help the animal. I mean, utilizing information like this, what you learn about the gut health of piglets and how that that can be managed, I suppose, in a way that gets them to the developmental point that you want them to be at hmm. at a certain period. I suppose that is probably um, an important factor of looking at research such as that into the gut. Yes, that's, that's the, the idea. And at the same time, uh, the, the process here is to do it in a way that like many, many times we focus too much when we say about the gut health, we focus too much on the, on the gut itself and in particular the intestine. But the animal, the, but the, at some point we can understand the piglet as a tube. So we have to, to try to, to use that tube to improve the animal, but we cannot forget that there is an animal there, that there is something ar around the gut. So it is important also for, for us in that development to understand the rest of the animal. And that's where you enter with all this method that we are developing now to try to understand the, what is going on in the gut, but also in the animal. Uh, and we are seeing that the rest of the animal, let's say, responds in a very particular way, as does the intestine. So we are using this method, for example, the ones that have, I say there, for example, saliva, is understanding through the gut because the, the mouth of the animal, as the rest of the intestine, is very well programmed and, and does particular functions and, and responds to particular uh, challenges. So the, the, the mouth of the animal is, uh, is the first point of contact. So that's part of the gut health of the, of the animal. That's where, where we are trying to understand how those places where we can take samples are actually showing you what is going on with the gut health and with the animal itself. So, Yeah, you mentioned the sort of testing of saliva there, which can tell you a lot, I'm assuming, about, about the piglet, but yet it's non-invasive really, well, as uh, non-invasive as, as you can get when you are trying to monitor the health of an animal. Hmm. Yes, 
actually I brought this uh, for you to have an idea. This is the, like an, pigs are, are animals that are by nature, and we are taking advantage of this, very curious. So you will give them a, a concrete wall and they will chew on it. So that's, that's what they do. They sample all the environment. They go into a room and they chew everything. So we take advantage of that. And for example, what we are using, the first thing is these ropes, for example, we give them to them and they love this. This is like a toy for them. So they just bite on this for one, two minutes and then we squeeze this and we get the saliva. Okay, if you, that's for a group of pigs, so you have 20 pigs in a pen and they will... They Piglets will, as well, like small Piglets, pig, yeah. whatever, yeah, even the sows, the sows do it. And then if you want an individual, for example, it's as simple as this, this is a sponge, or like any, anybody will have a sponge like this at home. So you give it to them and in two minutes they chew it and then you have the perfect sample here. And they actually enjoy this because it's a game for them. So it's a very big difference between having to immobilize an animal that is screaming and, and getting into a stress that changes completely the physiology and giving this to an animal and, and getting them to chew this and then you just, with a glove, you do like this and you get all the samples. So it's, it's a very different process and this doesn't affect the animal at all. The other one is going into a level of stress that, that changes everything. Especially if things that change very fast, like cortisol, for example, is, is a stress molecule that, that goes up very fast. So in, in two minutes you can have cortisol from normal levels to ten, ten times the level of, of normality. So That's incredible. It is very like human I suppose makeup in the sense that if a human is stressed we produce cortisol or adrenaline um, obviously piglets to a greater extent probably relative to, to their size and, and to their developmental age. The research that you're doing about these non-invasive methods of monitoring pig development overall how long will the project take or how long has it been in situ so far? Uh, the project in itself is uh, three years. We are one year into the project and it, compared to other projects, it's a project that should be very fast into practical use. So the guys that are doing the analysis, which are in, in Spain, are already working in methods that uh, allow this to be implemented in a farm. The idea here, and that's what makes the difference, is that normally for this kind of analysis you would call a veterinarian to go into your farm, collect the blood from the animal, and then do the analysis somewhere else. What we are aiming for here is to give these things to the farmer, and the farmer can do any time that he wants, like there is a batch of pigs going through the farm every week, so they could every week take one of these sponges, put some, some, some of the saliva in a kit that we give them, and then they test how well or bad are those animals. So the repercussion for this, for example, is many of the animals, you don't even know if they're going to be sick or not. With this kind of methods, you can predict it. And so you can avoid, for example, when you have to do a treatment just in case for them to have diarrhea or something like that, you just know with this. So you say, okay, these animals are sensitive to whatever is in the environment, so we have to treat them uh, in two days or whatever. So you will target much more the treatments and the interventions so that you can actually decrease the use of antibiotics and increase the welfare of the animals because you take care of them in advance of the problem happening. Absolutely. It also, you know, just at a very fundamental level, it's cutting out the cost of a vet being on the farm as well for the farmer. So it's of benefit to the farmer, it's of benefit to the farm, it's of benefit to the piglets. And essentially doing research like this, Edgar, what would be the ultimate goal? I suppose it's, would you say, to improve animal health? And obviously then the, the, the final outcome, I suppose, at the end of, of what is a supply chain, really, if it's a commercial pig farm. Yeah, it goes like when, when you are decreasing those treatments or, or preventing the disease from happening, it goes into a, an animal that grows better, that the, the quality of the life of the animal and the product is, is better, obviously. And you, you are safeguarding, uh, to some extent, the, the public health because all those antibiotics that are used in the animal, and we use less and less, but still you need some of them, uh, they, they can create uh, antimicrobial resistance, which is one of the biggest concerns now in, in the world. And by reducing the treatments or by controlling the treatments, you, you directly de decrease those uh, antimicrobial resistance that are in the environment. So it is a benefit beyond the animal itself that the product and the animal are, are better, but you, you affect the, it goes a little bit into this concept of one health that everybody is talking about now that this, uh, the environment is better, the, the animal is better, and then the, the life for people is, is better. So everything is, is benefited from something that you do in a, very, in a very restricted environment, which is the piglets. 
Well, it's all very interesting, Edgar. Thank you very much for, for joining us. We'll be very interested to hear of the, the final findings from the project when it concludes, but certainly some very interesting findings already. Thank you for joining us on Farmland. Thank you very much. Michael Fitzmaurice, thanks for joining us today on Farmland. I suppose let's talk first of all, Michael, about the energy crisis. It's the most um, pertinent thing that's really happening to everyone across the country at the moment. We're heading into winter now where people are going to find it very difficult to pay bills and to pay for fuel, I suppose, and have to start thinking about that now. Uh, what can be done at this stage on a practical level to try and help people out with those kinds of costs this winter? Well, first of all, um I think the first thing that needs to be done is that the government needs to take very fast decisions um, on certain infrastructure we have in this country because um, whatever about the price of electricity, the danger is about the lights going out. And we know that we are, you know, short electricity, to put it simple, to have a cushion for this winter. Um, there's, and I've done a, 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 I've done a video myself on it, Derry Bryan in County Galway, and look at, you know, I'm not going to go saying, standing in front of you here and saying that everything was done right. No, it wasn't. But at the given time when it was done, all the planning permissions were gone through that was there at the moment. And because the Irish state hadn't brought in an EIA directive, um, the planning permission was basically quashed. So it's like telling someone that got planning permission for their house 15 or 17 years later, bye-bye, you haven't planning permission now. Like, that doesn't operate in any country. The state is paying something like 15,000 a day. And... Not me, but I see the legal brains, the likes of Michael McDowell, who is a former Attorney General, has come out very clearly this week um, after we have done after we had done this video. And indeed, a lot of other, Pat McDonough, I believe, is out as well. And indeed, a lot of people right around the country. Um, we have enough of wind power there, when the wind blows, it doesn't always blow, and wind power is down, um, that would basically power the whole of County Galway. Um, and that would be a help. Second of all, we have two power stations, and I know that Bordenamon, I'm a realist, Bordenamon have taken up railway tracks. The peat, they haven't had basically there now. Um, the reserves they have is for Pete Briquettes from 25. But um, there's an opportunity, and I've talked to people in the SB about this, there's an opportunity that the likes of Shannon Bridge and the likes of Lanesborough uh, could be open for biomass. From my understanding, um, about six to seven weeks in talking to people that know everything that's in there in those uh, power stations. And those decisions can be made rapid to, first of all, give us the comfort that at least we'll know the lights will stay on. That's the first part of this. There is no silver bullet in the line of um, the power, say, in the line of oil coming in. It's out of our hands, to be frank about it. And about gas as well. But in the line of gas, I think we have to um, do a total, you know, rethink of where we're going as a country. Um, the doll decided when everything was hunky-dory and when there was plenty of gas and no pressure uh, years ago that we weren't going to give any more licenses for ex exploration. Um, I think we have to revisit that. I think we also have to revisit um, or make sure that the government changes, and they seem to be changing now, um, this idea of the LNG um, terminals, because um, we, are, we are in a crisis state, and Ireland has left itself, probably through EU law and, and um, EU decisions, I would blame, that we are left ourselves like the birds in the nest. Um, we're waiting for the worm to be dropped into our mouth. We're not in control of our own fuel security. And when you're not in control of your own fuel security, you run a huge risk. The biggest danger on top of that is the cost. In terms of, I suppose, the government, as you said, can only do so much in with to do with the cost. And that may come from Europe and there, there may be uh, a, some sort of cap that can be put there. But there is a real fear out there, and particularly I've come across it myself in rural Ireland, you know, people who, who, who buy, you know, oil every winter, or who, you know, have, have a turf, turf or a fire or a stove going to heat their water every winter. And people are now wondering how they're going to get that money because everything else has gone up. It's not just fuel that has gone up. We are in a cost of living crisis at the moment. And, you know, when, when people come along then and say, 
you mentioned yourself there's proposals coming from the government that they could possibly ban the installation of boilers um, in new builds and in, in sort of retrofits as well over the next few years. There's a lot of fear out there of people not knowing where they're going to turn, what they're going to do. Obviously, we all want to help the environment. We want to um, improve the climate and make sure that we meet targets. But at the same time, what that's expensive. That comes at a cost. What are people going to do? Well, the first thing is language is very important at the moment. And Minister Ryan seems to be um, on his own merry-go-round in relation to some of the statements that he has uh, come out with. Um, it's not helpful at a time of war, at a time that people are at their wits' end, uh, making statements about be it oil boilers, as you have pointed out, um, where they, you know, he's talking about from 2025 on, houses built after zero zero wouldn't would have to put in air to water to put it simple that you wouldn't be putting in gas or oil um that's not realistic first of all second of all it's not something you talk about um when uh people are basically wondering will the lights stay on um and i think that the irish people are sick and tired of some of the statements that's coming out from politicians uh at the moment in relation to this like we have to put things into perspective um our first priority as politicians should be basically the fundamental things that people need is heat, food and light. And we will have failed as a country if we cannot keep people um, okay in that situation. And whatever about the climate, and you know, there is new technologies, there is new things going to come down the line and we'll have offshore electricity, probably our offshore wind and probably, in my opinion, 2032 to 2035. They will say that some would be here before that. But you have to be realistic. There will be objections. There will be problems. Um, and people always vote with their feet. And if I give someone an alternative, and if you listen to the Greens, I don't believe what they say. They say wind is free. Well, Funnily enough, water comes from the sky, but the infrastructure you need and uh, to treat it and all that isn't free. But it's the same with wind. You have to put up the infrastructure to harness it. You have to spend seven or 800 million in the ESB for rock off. And what we need to do is leave people alone for the, for until we have basically the light bulb that will go on from a different source and that is secure. And... On top of that, there is quick wins if Eamon, if Eamon Ryan was bothered about resolving issues. He'd give an incentive for anaerobic digestion, by your guess. Um, he would also give a quick incentive for solar panels. How many firms <coughs> around the country have we that would be able to, if they got an incentive to, I looked at the building I came in here to today, I looked right around Dublin, how many buildings is there right around Ireland if an incentive was given for the likes of solar power? But unfortunately, look at it, it's all lip service that's going on. And some of the stuff that's going on is infuri infuriating people. At the moment, in my opinion, we need to park this whole climate crack of what we're doing. The basics we need this winter for the next six to eight months, until next March or April, is heat, light and food. And unfortunately, in a lot of them, we are falling short. And we need to put our resources into the into that. It's going to be a difficult winter, no matter what, apart from the, the, the energy um, situation. Everyone is experiencing rising costs this year. The cost of fuel has gone up, so has the cost of food. However, a lot of farm sectors are saying in particular that while the cost of food has gone up with the inflation, and we're looking at over 9% inflation rates in Ireland at the moment, Back at Farmgate, they're not getting those prices back. Yet all of their costs have gone up. Input costs have gone up. Um, contracting costs have gone up. Agri-diesel, more than has ever been now, the cost of it. And, I mean, what can be done for them? The budget is coming up in, in a couple of weeks' time. But the Minister, the, Th the Taoiseach and the Thonish that have both said, there's only so much we can do. They don't want to increase inflation either. And by taking some actions, that might be a result. But how does that help, you know, 
the farmer down the road who has seen his diesel bill go up by thousands alone this summer? Well, first of all, um, to address inflation. Um, inflation compared with 2008 or nine, we had a building bubble in 2008 or nine. When you rise interest rates or whatever, you cool that down. Inflation at the moment is out of our hands because it's gas, it's oil. Those are the two big drivers that's doing it. We've absolutely no control at the moment on that. So whatever measures that you're afraid to take in case to rise it more, it has nothing got to do with it because it's external. It's come, It's another country that we're relying on for those. So I don't buy into the argument that by helping people we could rise inflation more. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing, fortunately milk at the moment, I think it's something around 60 cent, which is pretty good. Um, and the cattle trade, unfortunately, has slipped. Um, like you look at two to three months ago and look at today, what we're being quoted in beef prices, you're looking at cattle were making 530, right? Um, I believe uh, 485 and looking maybe like 475, some of them are trying to pull them. So that's 50 cent in a, in a, in a, of a cut per kilo. On an average based or an average animal, it's between 170 euro and 200 euro. That's at a time when the I do contracted for my sins, and we had to put up the price of bacon. You know, simple as that because the diesel has gone higher. The farmer, especially on the beef side, is taking a fair hit. If you look at the fertilizer inputs, but the only thing, um, the fertilizer, a lot of farmers just walked away from it because they couldn't afford it. To be quite frank about it, um. Now, one thing there appears to be, I know in our in my area, uh, but w- our land where we'd be from be more marginal, and crops would have came on fairly well, whereas some areas would be you know burdened to be to be the the with the weather they got would be probably lower. But there seems to be a fair amount of fodder in the country uh, at the moment. But in the line of um, addressing the situation, first of all. It's not alone to address it for farmers, but to address it for all citizens. We have to put in a cushion. There is six and a half billion that's there, extra, extra taxes that's been got in. That's a lot of money. We have to be able to protect people um, from higher uh, electricity rates, but also we have to be able to uh, help them in their extra costs when they're not getting in anymore. Um, and the problem that I see, and I... I'll just touch on a few things. There's new schemes coming out at the moment. Um, There's a new acre scheme. And by God, it's true. It's acres you need to try and get the money in it. Because when I look at the aims of an environmental scheme, it's to help smaller farmers and help the environment. But what they have actually done in this scheme, if you look at it, compared with even Gloss, and Gloss, in my opinion, was a straight jacket you were in, um, they have left it in a way that farmers will probably end up, in my opinion, about 1,800 less on average for the smaller farmer up to 50 acres. And the reason I say that is that if you look at um, a farmer on 40 or 50 acres, if you look at most of them are going for the low-input permanent pasture. Mm -hmm. Well, the low-input permanent pasture has to have extra flowers now to get the high one. A lot of farmers won't have that. So you're looking at two grand, for the 10 hectares. That's 25 acres of your small farm gone. On top of that, you got paid under glass for fencing off water courses. That's included in that. Where they were getting 3150 or 3140 for the 10 hectares, they will now be only getting 2,000 euro. So straight away, that's 1,150 of a drop. On top of that, if you're a small farm, 25, 30, 40 acres, you cannot do your planting of your low Im- around your low input per- of trees around your low input permanent pasture. So, the idea of a scheme should be to encourage people. I've spoke to planners around the country. I spoke to one planner yesterday. They had forty farmers in. Right, that's not a good scheme for the planners either because they have to spend hours looking through the different say, parcels of land, and um, they had forty farmers four out of the 40 that would would be able to go into it that to be anyways worthwhile to go into. And then look at the other side, and I see it down my own way. 
um, where we'd have marginal land, um, and a lot of people went into the, the the wild bird cover. The wild bird cover now they have they're taking the dates back to the fifteenth of May, to make sure that the the ground is wet. That's the first thing. Like, does a bird know whether it was sown on the first of May, or the fifteenth of May, or the end of May, or the first week of June? You should sow something when the ground conditions are right. And on top of that, they are making they are they have added. Um, basically more different varieties to, to the wild bird cover and have made it very clear that if there isn't X amount of cover on it, um, then you'll lose your grant. We are now saying to farmers that are on boggyish type ground or marginal type ground, hey guys, where you put in that before, don't be looking at it again because if there's a failure or if you haven't did it in time, which if you look at the years, I could turf an iron. We spent two weeks of May standing this year. Last year, if you go back in it again, there was a week or two lost in May. Mm -hmm. And generally, you get good weather before it and after it. But if the ground conditions aren't right, we are forcing people to do something, actually um, do harm. Because if you're within a soil that didn't fit, you're pulling it apart. And this is all in the name of so-called environmental scheme. And I've looked at the environmental schemes that, that's there at the moment in Acres. And to even get any midland type payment, you'd want to own the acres, to be quite frank about it. It's no good to planners, it's no good to the farmers. And this is at a time when farmers are actually struggling to get money in. I looked at the uh, organic scheme, in fairness, um, for a lot of farmers, like I would always class lamb from any of the mountains. I would say, look, they come down the lowland towards the end of the year. But for God's sake, they're as good as organic any day of the week. I think there'll be a big uptake in that, um, in my own opinion, where farmers will be looking to cut costs. Um, but we need to incentivize as well. Like, there's a big push um, in the line of the suckler cow. To everyone, We see numbers dropping. We need to stabilise the suckler cow because if we don't, Ireland has a, a, has a history of, and a good name, in other countries, in the likes of Italy and different countries, for producing good quality weanlands. You talk to the people, the agents at the moment that are looking for good quality cattle, they're getting scarcer and scarcer. And if you don't produce good stuff, you won't be getting a good price. So we should be incentivizing things like that to make sure that the farmers, and indeed in the sheep side of it, um, like the word at the moment is a lot of hoggets going for killing. Mm. Well, that'll reduce numbers. And what we need to do is bring, is incentivize especially younger farmers to try and get them into those systems because um, there's a lot of elderly farmers and in fairness to them, they've, done, they've worked hard and done their day, but we need to make sure we incentivize. Like getting 10 or 12 euro for a yo, it's nearly an insult at this stage. Like how many years is that going on? We should be able to rise that up to help them offset meal costs because in the sheep sector, um, you will have meal costs at a certain time of year. We need to do them things to be able to try and cushion the blow for the farmers. Deputy Michael Fitzmaurice, thank you very much for joining us on Farmland today. No problem. That's all from Farmland for this episode. We'll be taking a short break from Farmland for the Ploughing Championships in Leash later this month, where Agriland will be the live stream partner of the Ploughing Championships. So our next episode of Farmland will be on Tuesday, October 4th. You can also listen to the Farmland podcast on Apple, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Be sure to click into agriland.ie or the Agriland app for all the latest agri news and follow us on social media at these links.